those who know this passage, you Bible students, know that we're talking about the Great Commission. And by the way, it is the Great Commission. It's not a little commission. It's the Great Commission. There is no commission like this commission. And uh, our mission is the Great Commission. You may think that it is a coincidence that you're here tonight, or you may think it's a coincidence that you were stationed here in uh, Yokoksa. Uh, and, and you may think that it's... Uh, uh, did I pronounce that wrong? Somebody's laughing over here. What is it? You coax them. Okay, well, we'll just, what is it? Anyway, here, this place, you know, this, like, like, like somebody said, there's no place like this place. This must be in place, okay? So, but uh, 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 it's not coincidence. And I really believe what Pastor was talking about tonight about breaking up the fallow ground. Um, I know that um, those who went before us in Latin America in the Spanish speaking world, uh, did not have an easy time of it. There was a time there when if someone got baptized uh, in the Spanish-speaking world, their whole family would cut them off. They were, they, they, were not even in, they were not even welcome at any wedding or any birthday, their own family. The missionaries told me about how they would go up and they would pour boiling water from the roof of the house as they knocked on the doors. Weldon Jones had that happen to him in Jalisco, Mexico. Many times they would get rocks and they would pick rocks up and throw them at us like you would throw rocks at a dog, a stray dog that had come into the neighborhood. Um, I was preaching in Pasco, Washington. We have a conference there every year with Pastor Otto. And um, one of the pastors that came to that conference came up to me and he said, uh, uh, Brother Garlic, he said, I, I, I want to ask you to forgive me. And I said, why? He said, well, I don't know if it was me. But back there in Jalisco, where you learned Spanish back in the 60s, he said, uh, I was one of the ones that the priest would organize to go and rock the missionaries, throw rocks at the missionaries. And he said, I just want you to know, I don't know if I actually threw rocks at you, but I did throw rocks at a lot of missionaries. And he said, but I just want you to know now I'm, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm a pastor there in the church. And those men were faithful. They never saw the big crowds. They never saw the, the large numbers. And yet we owe them such a debt of gratitude because now we're seeing the big crowds. And now we're seeing the large numbers. And yet I'm here to tell you that we, we are building where others have laid a foundation. We're reaping where we have not sown. And I thank God for those heroes. And I know that this nation... I, I wish that, that 10,000 missionaries had responded to General MacArthur's call. We may be living in a different nation at this time if they had come. Uh, I, I'm not sure the uh, most, that I've, the most uh, liberal estimate that I've heard of the ones that come has been 200 at that time. This nation has turned the wonderful pride and patriotism that they had turned to military means they've turned it into business. And secularism and humanism has invaded this country. And while we went to see the Buddhas today, okay, most of this nation is humanist. Most of this nation is secularist. And most of this nation is blinded by materialism. Because not only did we go to see the Buddhas today, we also went to PC computers. We also went to Yamadas. And it's interesting to see what's happened here. And so there's a purpose and a reason for your being here. And that reason is to break up the fall of ground. Uh, look in there, chapter 28. Most people like to start with verse 19, but we can't start there because it contains the third word there in that verse is the word therefore. And any time you see the word therefore in the scriptures, you have to look and see what it's there for. In other words, you have to understand it's saying because of what I just told you, I want you to do something or I want to tell you something else. And uh, so when we go back to see what he just told us, it's interesting. Look at verse 16. Then the 11 disciples <laughs> went away into Galilee. There were 12, right? How many of you heard about the 12 disciples? And now there's 11 because one of them was a traitor. And uh, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. These sound like good fellows. First of all, they're disciples. Second of all, they're moving. Huh. 
I, I, I would prefer somebody that's moving, even if he's moving in the wrong direction, than somebody's just not going anywhere, right? And they're moving up. You know, water will always follow the course of least resistance, but these guys are going up to a mountain, and they're going to the mountain where Jesus had appointed them, where he told them they're beating, they're obeying Christ. I like these guys. It gets better in the next verse. And when they saw him, they're looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. They worshiped him. Wow, this sounds like my kind of, my kind of crowd right here. The disciples that are actively obeying Christ, going against the, the downhill path, but uphill because that's where Christ had wanted them to go. And uh, they're looking at Jesus, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. Uh, but I want you to notice the verse says, but some doubted. I want you to understand something. You're not the only one that's ever had doubts. See, there is, a, there is a devil. Just as real as our good brother uh, Rodriguez uh, was telling us about the reality of God in his life. Um, the, uh, uh, um, it is Rodriguez, right? <laughs> Gonzalez, mira nomás. Este gringo, mira nomás, that's a great answer. Alberto, ¿verdad? Mira nomás, this, this gringo. I tell you what, I don't have jet lag as an excuse today. I don't know. I, they say there's two signs of getting old, but I can't remember what they are. I can't remember for the life of me what they are. But, uh, but you know, we're, we're going to get Yokosuka down, and we're going to get Gonzalez down before we're done here, I promise you. But just as real as God, God was to our brother, as he testified here, there's, there, there's a Satan as well. And he's in the job of sowing doubts. He likes to sow doubts. As a matter of fact, he's tried to sow doubts in the minds of every one of us this week. And some doubted. Uh, there, is, there is a danger that we have of coming to, to, to the church. And let me tell you what it is. Sometimes we come to church and we put on what I call the Baptist face. Now, the, or the Christian face. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about, okay? That's where, you, that's where you're coming up to church and, and you're in the car with your wife and you're fighting like a like cats and dogs, you know, just about ready to tear each other up. And you come to church and you open the door and something magical happens. You put on the Baptist face. You put on the Christian face. You come in. God bless you, my brother. Been praying for you, my brother. Uh-huh. Liar, but they, we say it. You know, that's the Baptist face. And, and there's a danger in that. By the way, there's nothing wrong with putting on uh, uh, a good face when you come to church. Please don't come with the devil's face. Okay? Um, uh, if you come over to our house, we have plates that we eat from every day, and then we have plates that we have for guests. And when you come, we take out the plates for guests. You may see these plates, and you may say, Wow, these are really nice plates. There's nothing wrong with putting that out for you. You come over to our house, and, and I'll tell the, the garlic boys, I'll tell them, Today, I don't want any toys in the living room. So you'll come over and everything will be neat and orderly. And you'll say, wow, those garlic boys, they, they really, don't you believe it, okay? <laughs> well, we just did it for you out of respect to you. As a matter of fact, it's, re, it's a matter of respect to put on a good face when we come to church. It's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is if I try to convince you that's the face I have on all the time. You know, if I try to convince you that my living room looks that clean all the time, now that's hypocrisy. That's, that's more than hypocrisy. That's just a lie, okay? But cleaning it up when you're coming over, that's respect. That's courtesy, okay? So there's nothing wrong with putting on the Baptist faith, but there is a danger. Let me tell you what it is. Sometimes we come to church, and we're, we're in the battle. There's some challenges in our life. And we look around, and everybody else, it seems like, Everything's going great. And we can get to thinking we're the only one that has doubts. We're the only one that battles the flesh. Don't you believe that for a minute? Everybody here is in the battle. And everybody here is facing that battle. So just because we put on a good face to come to church out of respect for each other, uh, I don't want anyone to think that you're alone. That you're the only one that's having the struggles. You're the only one that's that's having these battles because you're not alone. We're all in that. We're all we're all in that together. Here, these are the the very disciples. These are the men that set the world on fire. God used these men to 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 to, to start what's happening here tonight in this church was started by by these men. And 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 you know what? These men, okay, 
had doubts. And they were good men. They were obeying. They were disciples. The scripture tells us. And the disciples, the 11 disciples, were going to the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And they're looking right at Jesus and they're worshiping him. But they still had some doubts. And so I want to, I want to share something. If you have doubts, right here in my hand, I have the medicine for doubt. Amen. It's the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is, this is, this is the doubt cure right here in my hand. It's the word of God. And uh, that's what we're preaching here tonight. But uh, it says, uh, when they saw him, they, some doubted. Verse 18, I want you to notice what Je how Jesus responded to their doubts. He got close to them. You know what we like to do to people who doubt us? We like to get away from them. We like to, you know, well, who needs them? You know, if they're going to doubt me, you know, who needs them? And yet Jesus recognized that the physician came not to heal those who are whole, but the sick. You know who needs you more than anyone else is the, is the very one who's doubting. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, people in ministry can get weary because it seems like the people that you sacrifice the most to help are the first one to put the knife in your back when you're not looking. You know, Somebody told, uh, I think it was Charles Spurgeon one time, said, did you know so-and-so is mad at you? And, 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 and Pastor Spurgeon said, well, I don't know why. I've never done anything good for him. <laughs> it just seems like sometimes that the people you do the most for, you sacrifice the most for, are the first ones to do that. And, and, and if there were any group of people on this earth that Christ had poured himself into, it were these 11. He had every right to reprove them and say, how dare you doubt me? And yet he didn't. Because what he did is he drew near to them and he gave them the medicine. Look what it says there, verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. It's the word of God. And, and Jesus Christ is God. He's Jehovah God. Someone says, I can't explain that, neither can I. But the Bible says it very clearly. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then everyone tells us who it's talking about. Says so this word was, became flesh and dwelt among us. It's Jesus that he's talking about. He's God. And, and this God, and by the way, if you take away the deity of God, we don't have a mediator between God and man. Uh, and you take away the humanity of, of Jesus Christ, we don't have a mediator. Because he's the God-man, he's the bridge that Jacob saw. He's the ladder that Jacob saw between heaven and earth. He's the one that joins us. And there is one mediator between God and man. You be careful of any man who says, come to me to get something from God. Be careful of any man that says that. Because there's only one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. And I remind you, Jesus Christ is the one who stood and said, in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way. Singular. I know many people in this society and culture would have us believe there are many ways to the top of the mountain. But Jesus Christ said, no, there's only one. He said, I am that way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And then to erase any doubt, or any equivocation of what he's saying, he further clarified his words with this statement. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you realize if one person could have access to God through Buddha, then Jesus Christ would have been a, is a liar. Because Jesus Christ said no one can come to Christ through Buddha or through Mary. I was in a little, little town in, in Guanajuato, Mexico. And I was sharing the gospel with an elderly man and when I got to the end, he said, you know what? I want to be saved. I believe what it says. But I've never talked to Jesus in my life. He said, every time I pray, I pray to Mary. And I said, well, you know, uh, Mary as the mother of Jesus Christ. And Jesus respected her as, in, in, in all of his humanity, but he never gave her permission over his divine authority. And, and, and I said, do you remember the first miracle? Some of you remember the first miracle. When, when Jesus turned water into wine, and, uh, and, and they came first to Mary and they said, hey, get Jesus to do a miracle. And so Mary went to Jesus and I showed him right there in the scriptures. And, and, and she said, and Jesus answered her back saying, woman, what have I to do with you? And when he saw that, he said, no, that's got to be a Protestant Bible. That can't be the truth. And I said, well, do you have a Catholic Bible? It says the same thing. He said, I don't have one. I went back to the church and the pastor asked me, well, the, what was the matter? And I told him the story. He said, I have a Catholic Bible. Remember those old Catholic Bibles, you know, that were, you know, about the size of a, of a footlocker, you know, 
big old, big old family Bibles here, and I was, uh, believe it or not, I, I in those days I was skinny as a beanpole. I, I know it's hard to believe, but that's the way I was. I went running back through the streets of, of Guanajuato, uh, uh, Guanajuato, Mexico, and I knocked on his door. I said, hey, I've got a Bible. And he looks at the front. Yep, it was blessed by the bishop so-and-so. And we went to the passage, and there it was. Uh, Jesus said to his mother Mary when she asked him to do a miracle, what have I to do with you? And you know what Mary said? Mary said to those that wanted the miracle, you better talk to him directly. <laughs> you just do what he tells you to do. And so when they came up and talked to Jesus directly, then he did the miracle. And that's what Christ was saying here. The only access to God is through me. And so Jesus, when he spake, is God. And as he spoke, that means it's God's word. So he was giving them the medicine for their doubting. He was giving them the word of God. He spake unto them. And look what he says. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I've already triumphed over death. I've already been buried and rose from the dead. I've already died for your sin. All power is given unto me. By the way, that's the Christ we serve. Some of the religious paintings have Christ weak and, and dead and dying. Many times I have seen statues of, of Mary standing over the body of Christ. Many times I have seen these big, that's not the Christ of the Bible. We serve a risen Savior. Yes, it is true that He died, but He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And that's the Christ that we serve. It's the risen Christ. And uh, all power is given to me. I'm sure glad that He rose from the dead. I was in a taxi in New York City. We have a conference there every year with uh, the oldest fundamental independent Baptist Spanish church in all of the United States of America. It's in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, that church has had two pastors, Pastor Acevedo Sr. and Pastor Acevedo Jr. Pastor Acevedo Jr. now is, is, is just about up to 80. And so I don't know who the next pastor is, but, uh, uh, but uh, 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 most of the uh, uh, large number of the taxi drivers in New York are Muslims. And I, I, was, I was taking a taxi ride and the Holy Spirit said, talk to him about Christ. I don't know. How many of you have ever had that happen? The Holy Spirit just says, talk to them or give them a track. Have you, ever, have you ever had that experience? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? By the way, if, if he ever tells you, talk to him, go ahead and talk. You say, I don't know what to say. Oh, he doesn't make mistakes. If he, if he, somebody says, well, how do I know it's, it's, it's God that wants me to talk to him? And I ask you, well, do you think it's the devil? You know, I, I believe it is God that wants you to talk to him. So when you have that experience, go ahead and talk. I don't know what you're going to do. You may, you may be planting, you may be sowing, you may be watering, or you may be reaping, but just go ahead and talk. So I began to talk to this young man, and he said to me, oh, he said, I believe in Jesus. By the way, the Quran teaches about Jesus. And, and I said, uh, 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 yes, I said, but do you believe he's God? Oh, no, 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 he's a great prophet, he said, just like Muhammad is a great prophet. But he said, Muhammad is the superior prophet to Jesus. So says the Quran. And I've read the Quran. So I asked him, I said, well, I have a question for you. Where is Muhammad buried? Oh, he said, uh, we, over there in Saudi Arabia, we have uh, there uh, the tomb of, uh, of the prophet Muhammad. And every year we celebrate the Hajj. And we go and, and, and we visit the, the sepulcher, the tomb, where Muhammad is buried. And, and he said, every Muslim, every good Muslim has to go at least once in his life to see the tomb where, Mo where Muhammad was buried. By the way, the Muslim missionaries have reached the Maya Indians, where we have never reached with the gospel yet, I say this to our shame, and I read of a Maya an Indian woman who sold her little farm and sold her animals to buy a ticket so she could go and visit the tomb of Muhammad. And so I said, oh, so that's where Muhammad is buried. Then I asked him, where is Jesus Christ buried? Oh, he said, because the Quran proclaims the resurrection of Christ. He says, he, he's not dead. He's still alive. And I asked them the natural follow-up question. I said, how is it that according to you, Muhammad is the superior prophet, and yet he's the one who's still dead? He couldn't answer that, you know. Today we went to see the statues of Buddha. I don't know if you read, but here just a few years ago, they found in China what they, are, they honestly believe are the bones from the fingers of the first incarnation of Buddha because they believe he had 33 incarnations, reincarnations. They believe that he's just going around and around and around. They believe he's come back in all kinds of different forms. 
uh, as a boy and as a as a girl and as a, and all all kinds of things. They they just believe he's going around and around. Uh, by the way, the Bible says something different. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. You see, God declares that there is only one life, and this is it. This 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 lie of re is a lie from the devil. It's a it's a it's a lie to deceive the people to think it really doesn't matter much what I do in this life because I get another chance. And God says that's not true. But they they document it and they believe these are the bones from the, what they say is the first incarnation of Buddha. By the way, if they are the bones of Bo of the first incarnation of Buddha, they are the bones of the only incarnation of Buddha. Okay. But uh, uh, one of the other monasteries got very jealous because they said, how come you guys get all the good stuff? You know, we deserve to have the bones of the fingers of Buddha in our town as well. And there was a great controversy. And finally they solved it by loaning the bones from the fingers of Buddha. But they had to return them. And so they came with great fanfare and celebration and got the bones and carried them to their town and they felt so privileged. Now we have the bones from the fingers of the founder of our religion here in our town. I don't know about you. If I'm going to go to a clinic to lose weight, I don't want the doctor to be fat. You know, I want what he's going to have me do to have worked for him. And I praise the Lord that when I look for eternal life, I find it in He who rose from the dead. Jesus Christ said, all power is given unto me. I have all power. Praise the Lord. And now you understand what the word therefore is there for. He said, because all power is given unto me, I want you to do something. Now that first little word in verse 19 is a word that's so misunderstood. It's so simple. I was in a, in a Christian school teaching from this passage, and I asked the students, what does the word go mean? And a little girl, she must have been every bit of three years old, raised her hand, just signaling like this to me, and she raised her hand, and, and I said, yes, ma'am. She stood up and she said, it means we have to move. <laughs> You know, she'd got it where some theologians have missed it. And we laugh, but I want to ask you, when's the last time you moved from where you were to tell some sinner about the gospel message of Christ? Our triumph, says Christ. I know you're doubting, but I've already conquered it. All power is mine. Now go and tell everyone. I want you to look tonight because tonight we're going to study four ingredients necessary for someone to be saved. Four ingredients necessary for somebody to be saved. Look, if you would, please, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8. After we pray, we're going to begin reading in verse 26. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we ask you now to do what no human can do. Stir our hearts to your cause as we consider making a difference in our families. And I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. While we remain in an attitude of prayer, I'm going to ask you to pray right there where you're at. Just silently pray to, to God and ask God, God, speak to me tonight. Talk to me tonight. Change me tonight. Go ahead and ask him. Thank you for answering prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Amen. Acts chapter 8 verse 26 begins with the words, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying... Now I want to I clarify something right here, right now. 
I really appreciate what Pastor said about the call of God is not that God appears in an audible form as he did to Samuel saying, Mark Sage, I'm calling you Mark Sage. That's not the way God does it today. You see, we have something that Philip did not have. We have this book. And you and I do not need a call when we have a command. A command supersedes a call. By the way, uh, many of, uh, of, of those who are in the military understand exactly what I said. A command supersedes a call. And uh, Philip didn't have this. Philip was in the middle of a revival. And when the angel of the Lord appeared unto Philip, telling him to go, I'm sure it didn't make a lot of sense. That's why it's so important what we taught last night about the four, the four steps to happiness. You have to hear the word. You have to obey the word. And you have to obey it even when it doesn't make sense. You mean you want me to leave the revival and go to the desert? Yep, that's what I want you to do, Philip. And I'm glad he obeyed. Look at what it says. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. And verse 27 says, And he arose and went. Now, I've known a lot of servants of the Lord over the years. Because of my dad, and my dad was very good friends with many of the servants of the Lord. I have pictures of myself as a, as a, as a, as a, as a young boy in the arms of Dr. Bob Jones Sr. Um, I was telling uh, our friends, uh, the Call Callahans, I, 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 you're going to have to get me with these names tonight. I'm telling you what. Um, but I was telling them about uh, Dr. John R. Rice uh, had our picture on his on his um, refrigerator. And every morning he prayed for us. And I know that many of the things that God's doing in my life today are because of the prayers of these men from yesterday. I was, I was very good friends with uh, Dr. Lester Roloff. As a matter of fact, um, uh, many, many times... He and I ate together alone uh, as, 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 he, as, as he would come to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Um, I, 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 he taught me a lot of character because when my dad asked if we could park our trailer on his property, he said we could if I would work on the farm. So I know what it is to get up every morning at 4 o'clock and milk. Uh, we had two cows and 14 goats, and it was my job to milk them, you know, you know morning and night. Okay, so I understand what that's all about. Uh, I... I I, when I say I know, I mean I, I, I knew. I, I ate with many times and traveled with uh, Curtis Hudson and Lee Robertson, uh, and I know him and Tom Malone and many of the heroes that, that, uh, of, of the faith that, that are of our generation. Um, I, I, I knew Jack, Dr. Jack Hiles very well and, uh, and many, many other, other heroes. And, and many of the, of the men that God's using today, God has privileged me to be friends with them, with uh, Dr. Chapel, Dr. Sexton, Dr. Treber. Some of these other men, Dr. Shelton Smith, some of those men, I'm privileged to, to have preached with them and to, and to know them. In the Spanish-speaking world, uh, it's a privilege to know some of the great heroes of the faith there, like Brother Cordova and Brother Ali and Brother Salazar and some of these great men. I, I'm saying all that to, to, just to let you know this. All of these men come from different perspectives, different backgrounds, different philosophies, different methods. And those of you who know these men know I just went, went all over the rainbow when I talked about the different men that I knew. But there's one thing every one of them had in common. Without exception, every one of them obeys God. So it's natural when God said to Philip, arise and go, of course he arose and went. Because that's what a servant of God does. And if you're not willing to obey God, then... You should take yourself off the title list of the servants of the Lord. And by the way, in my vocabulary, there is no higher compliment than to say that someone is really serving God. Because there is absolutely no difference between what you do and what I do. If you're doing what God wants you to do, it's just as important as me going and preaching. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, to the Christian, there is no difference between the secular and the sacred. All ground is holy ground, and every bush is a burning bush. I believe that with all of my heart. Some of you, your ministry is just rearing those children to serve God. Who knows what the impact will be through your ministry? 
I know all of us are placed here in Japan at this time for a specific purpose. Why do you think the devil is fighting so hard, many of you? Why do you think the devil fights conferences like this so hard? Because he knows exactly what God's plan is for this nation. And I hope and pray that someday we will see revival in this nation. And I do believe that you could be part of, as Pastor said, those who God uses to break up that fallow ground. But as we look forward, it says, He arose and went. And look what it says there. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, reign of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. First ingredient so somebody can be saved. Have to have a sinner. By the way, this is an exceptional sinner. Look at these qualities of this sinner. First of all, he's a eunuch. He's a moral man. Of great authority, he's a man of influence and power. The queen had placed him in charge of all her treasure. Now, he was either a man of integrity and honest, or at least he had convinced her that he was, because she charged him with all the treasure. He'd come to Jerusalem to worship. He's a religious man. He was returning, sitting in his chariot. He was a wealthy man. And he was reading Isaiah the prophet. He was an educated man. This is a man that the world would say, wow, look what a human being can achieve. Look what a human can become. Here's a man who's moral, a man of integrity, a man of influence and political power, a man who's religious, a man who's wealthy, a man who's educated. Wow, look what a man can become. But I want to remind you, this man with all of his good qualities was on his way to hell. In spite of all these good qualities, he was on his way to hell. Now, you may be a very good person. Our, our, our brother said, I believe it was our, our, our brother tonight that said, um, I felt I was as good as anybody else. I think Brian said that when he was talking. I, th I felt I was as good as anybody else when he was talking with me before the service. You may be as good as anybody else. Do you know how many sins you have to commit to be separated from holy God? Just one. And you know what the problem is? I've already committed it. And you have too. You say, how do you know? God told me. When did God tell you? In the Bible, he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you too. Maybe you haven't done the big sins. But for God, sin is sin is sin. And we put sins in the big category, in the little category. But God only has one category. It's the category of sin. Maybe you haven't done a lot of sins. But I know everyone here has done at least one because the Bible says all have sinned. And did you know with that one sin, you're separated from holy God? Religion comes in and says, do this and do that and it'll be okay. But a good work today cannot erase my sin of yesterday. I can't die for your sin because I owe for mine. And you can't die for my sin because you owe for yours. But there is one who never owed. His name is Jesus. And he in love became man. Some of us experience what we call culture shock as we come to a country like this. And there are all kinds of things that are hard to get used to. Uh, today we went over to, was it Kamaka? See, I got, whatever that was, I, we went there. And, and, we're, and we're driving down and we saw a very unusual sight. There was a car driving backwards on the same road we were on. You and I know what had happened. They had turned onto the expressway on the wrong lane. <laughs> and they were desperately trying to retrace their steps before they had a head-on collision. They didn't even have time to turn around. They had gotten on, they'd seen their mistake, and they were driving backwards down the road like this. There's all kinds of culture shock. Can you imagine what it was like for God to become man for the first time, no thirst? 
for the first time become tired? For the first time to know pain? And not only that, the Creator being mocked by the created. And He did this in love for you and I. And He didn't know any sin. I can't pay for your sins. I already owe for mine. But He never owed. And that's why He could pay for you. And He did pay for you. Nearly 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, all of your sin was paid for. And all of mine too. What I'm saying to you this evening is that your mother may be a wonderful, wonderful mother. She may be the best mother that's ever lived. But if she doesn't come to Christ and receive by faith His gift of salvation, your mother is on her way to hell. Because as good as she is, she too has committed at least one sin. Your dad may be a wonderful dad. Your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, they may be good people. This was a good man. But this man was on his way to hell. Because he has, at this point, had not received the gift of salvation from Christ. By the way, the first ingredient so someone can be saved is a sinner. And I have only been here in Japan two days, and I found we don't have any shortage of sinners. Uh, they're all over. <laughs> yep. Second ingredient so somebody can be saved is found in verse 28. The Ethiopian eunuch was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. The second ingredient so somebody can be saved is the Bible. It's the Word of God. This is what God uses to convict them of sin. This is what God uses to give them faith to believe. It's the Bible. The sinner does not need my stories. The sinner needs scripture. This is the seed. Do you remember the parable of the sower? It says the sower went forth to do what? To sow. It's just assumed that he had some seed. And later on when the disciples said, clarify the story for us. He said the seed is the word of? It's the Bible. This is essential for somebody to be saved. By the way, I love the illustration of the sower because that sower was just sowing everywhere. You see, you and I don't have the right to prejudge the soil. We're just to sow. We're just to put the seed out. The seed has life in itself. And yes, some will fall on stony ground. Yes, some will fall where the thorns and the cares of this world will choke it out. But some will fall on fertile ground. And it'll surprise you sometimes what ground is the fertile ground. Sometimes the person least likely you thought to receive is the one where that seed will take root and spring and give life, lead them to eternal life. So it is that the Word of God is essential for somebody to be saved. By the way, I'm happy to announce that we also have that here. Our spiritual ancestors paid a price so I could have this book in my hand. They shed blood so that I could have this book in my hand today. I thank God for the Word of God. The third ingredient so someone can be saved is found in verse 29. Look what it says. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. For somebody to be saved, God has to be present. The Holy Spirit of God. By the way, if you're telling a lot of people about the gospel message of Christ and very few are receiving, it could be that what you're missing is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Somebody spoke about the power of of the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, uh, within the past 24 hours. The truth of the matter is the power of the Holy Spirit is essential for our life. It's essential for our life. I want you to look right here what it says. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And look at the obedience of Philip, verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? I want you to get the picture. The sinner's here. The Bible is there. He has the Bible open to the right passage so he can understand salvation. Not only does he have the Bible open to the right passage so he can understand salvation, the Holy Spirit's there and willing and ready. But there's still something missing. Because there is a fourth ingredient for somebody to be saved. First ingredient's the sinner. The second ingredient's the Word of God. The third ingredient is the Spirit. But look at verse 30. Understandest thou what thou readest? And then verse 31. 
And he said, that's the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I accept some man should guide me? The fourth ingredient so somebody can be saved is you. Now, I don't understand what I'm going to say to you right now. I don't understand it. But I know it's the truth. No one who is saved today is saved but that God used another human to tell them about the gospel. There are no exceptions to that. I don't understand why a sovereign God chose to put the treasure in earthen vessels, but he chose to do it that way. I know that when that happens, that no one can say, oh, what a vessel. Everybody has to say, oh, what a treasure. I know that's part of it. But the sovereign God didn't have to choose humans to tell the gospel message. He could have sent angels. He did send angels, did he not, to announce the birth of Christ? Isn't it true that he sent angels to proclaim the resurrection of that same Christ? If he so chose, he could send angels to every person living in this country. He could send angels to everyone that's stationed here in the military base. He could send angels to your mom and to your friends and family back home. He could do that. And they could, that angel could announce, hey, I'm here to tell you something. I want to tell you there is a God. I want to tell you Jesus Christ died for you. I want to tell you that he didn't stay dead. He was buried, but he rose again the third day. And he's paid for your sin. I want to tell you salvation is in him and him alone. That it's not in the church. The church didn't die for you. It's not in the baptism. The baptism didn't die for you. It's in Christ and him alone. I want to tell you that. He could have sent angels to do that, but he didn't. He could have had the animals proclaim the gospel message of Christ. He's quite capable of sending a parrot to sing on every windowsill tomorrow morning the gospel message of Christ in, in a voice intelligible in every tongue and every language. He could do that, but he won't do that. He did use animals to communicate other messages to man. Do you remember the prophet that was riding on his donkey? And, and the donkey began to talk to him in an audible voice, and the prophet was so stubborn, he just answered the donkey back as if it were a normal conversation. <laughs> you remember that story? He's not going to do that. God is capable of making the very stones begin to cry out, out loud. God could do that. He said, if these cease to praise me, the stones will praise me. But God's not going to do that. Everyone who is saved today is saved because another human was used by God to take them the message. I don't understand why a sovereign God would do that, but he chose to do it that way. You say, wait a minute, I was saved all alone reading my Bible in my house all alone. Yes, we talked about that last night. And who wrote the Bible? God could have spoken and the roles would have appeared already written. God could have had an angel take dictation like a secretary and he could have spoken and the angel could have penned the words. But God in his sovereignty chose to use men. He used, he used people because it pleases him to put the treasure in earthen vessels. And I have a question for you. If you don't tell your mother about the gospel of Christ, who's going to tell her? If you don't tell your father about the gospel message of Christ, who will tell him? If you don't tell your brother, your sister about the gospel message of Christ, who will tell them? If you don't tell your friends and co-workers at the base about the gospel of Christ, who will tell them? I preached this message a few weeks ago in Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake City has a thriving Spanish population there. The next day I had a friend from that church buying 22 of the tracks, uh, Como Ser Salvo, How to Be Saved, and it just seemed like an odd number. And I said, why are you buying 22 of these tracks? He said, Brother Garlic, last night I couldn't sleep. Because I have 22 family members in Juan Cayo, Peru, who've never heard. And so I got up and, and went online and I bought my ticket. 
And I'm going back to Juan Cayo, Peru, to tell my 22 family members the gospel message of Christ. You know, it's easy to talk about making a difference in the world. But tonight, I'm just talking about making a difference in your family. And I have a question for you. Have you told everybody in your family the gospel message of Christ? Have you told everybody in your family the gospel message of Christ? Verse 13 says, ye are the salt of the earth. It's not a command, it's a statement of fact. You have a job to do, your job is on this earth. Don't get to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Okay? Your job is here and now. I understand someone says we're here to glorify God. Oh yes, you are right. No one who is failing to fulfill the Great Commission is here glorifying God, period. If you and I are going to glorify God, we're going to fulfill the Great Commission. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he said, all power is given unto me. I've already triumphed. Now I want you to do something. Go. I want you to move. I want you to go and tell. Pastor and I have been talking about the every creature principle. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost his savor, did you know you could fail to fulfill your purpose on this earth? You could fail to fulfill your purpose on this earth. The sad truth is, is that you could fail to tell your mother about Christ. That could happen. You could fail to let the light shine to every member of your family. You could fail to that, do that. But it says, if it's lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. Well, who is the light of the world? Isn't there a song that says the light of the world is Jesus? But now we're the light of the world. You see, we're to reflect him. I have rock collection from all over the world. Some people think I have rocks in the head, but they're wrong in spite of my inability to remember names. But the truth of the matter is, I have rock collections from the brook Kids run, uh, from the brook where David got the stones to uh, kill Goliath. They were nice and smooth stones. He was a nice fella. He didn't want to cut him all. all just wanted to kill him, that's all. Got nice smooth stones there. And I have, I have rocks from where they think Christ was crucified. It's a Muslim cemetery. I doubt seriously if the current political climate would allow any Christian to go in there now today. But years ago, we did go in. And uh, as we prayed there, I reached down with my little hands and grabbed some rocks. And I have those rocks. I have rocks from all over the world. I wanted to see a moon rock back in the Apollo era. My dad would take some time every week with each member of the family, and he would always ask us, what do you want to do? And I asked him, I want to go see the moon rock. It came to El Salvador and the World's Fair. And so we went to see the moon rock. How many of you have ever seen a, a, a moon rock? Well, the rest of you haven't missed much. <laughs> I was so disappointed. We stood in line over 45 minutes to see the moon rock. And there it was in a nice glass box. And we got up there and it was gray and ugly and had no beauty in it. I had prettier rocks in my garden than the ones they'd brought back from the moon. And that night my dad taught me a lesson. He took me out and he showed me that beautiful uh, tropical moon. And he said, what's the difference between that moon up there and the rock we saw today? And I said... Well, Dad, that one's reflecting the light of the sun. And my dad says, always remember this. There is no beauty in us. But if we can reflect Jesus to those around us, they will see that which is beautiful. Jesus is the light of the world, but here he says, you're the light of the world. Because you and I are to be reflecting him to those around us. I want you to see two things about the light. Number one, you can't be hid. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Number two, you're not meant to be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto... Somebody tell me what the next word is. All that are in the house. God has placed you in your family for a specific reason and for a specific purpose. Tonight he brought you to hear this sermon. 
And I want to have a question. I have a question for you. Have all that are in your household, all that are in your family, have they seen the light of the gospel? Have they heard the gospel? If you don't tell them, who will? Every head bowed and every eye closed.